that right there. Take your Bibles, go to Luke chapter 7 and verse number 1. And we're going to read verse number 1 through verse number 10. Luke chapter 7 and verse number 1 through verse number 10. I'm going to let you get there and then I'm going to pray. Uh, so I'm going to let you arrive there at Luke chapter 7. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, look on with someone around you. And uh, there you go. And uh, Luke chapter 7, once you're there, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, what a wonderful opportunity it is to be back in your house tonight. And uh, Lord, I'm going to ask that uh, uh, you take the truth of your word and that you get it across to who we are. Uh, and Lord, may our lives be changed. May we change our thinking so that we can change our action, so that we can change the outcome. And Lord, that's what we're here for. We're not here to go in a circle and to cover ground that we've already covered. Lord, we're here to step up uh, the stairs and to step up the steps and to head upward and onward. And Lord, when you said greater works than these shall you do, Lord, truly you meant for us to do greater works. And help us to give us now a greater understanding of the Bible. Bless us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm a firm believer uh, the more that I live that we have a responsibility for the next generation I think for someone to live and die and think that they have no responsibility for people coming after them I think is a very foolish way of thinking uh, we have children we have grandchildren we have teenagers we have those that we influence and I think it's we are responsible to leave the right kind of path for them to walk in after us Tonight I want to dive into Luke chapter 7 and we're going to read the story and I think that you'll understand the stories we're reading it and then I want to make a bridge about uh, at the beginning of the sermon from the truth uh, to, to where that I believe the Lord wants us to go back to the to the truth of the, of the word here and we're going to keep it in context look at Luke 7 1 now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people he entered into Capernaum and a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he had heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this, speaking of the centurion. And here's what they said about the centurion, for he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. But say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found, underline these next three words, in fact, if you'll say them together with me out loud, are you ready? I have not found, here it is, ready? So great faith I want you to say those three words again out loud are you ready so great faith no not in Israel and they that were sent returning to the house found the servant whole that had been sick I'm gonna to preach tonight on this subject and I promise you for about 30 minutes uh, and uh, 30 minutes on this subject the key to building so great faith in others the key to building so great faith in others this centurion had so great faith he just didn't have faith and he just didn't have great faith he had so great faith it's the word that's used in John 3 16 for God so loved the world it is not just faith it is not just great faith it is so great faith it was so much faith that he didn't even have to have the presence of Jesus. He just simply said this, Lord, you just speak the word and my servant will be healed. Lord, I don't even want you to break from where you're at. You just speak the word and my servant will be healed. He was so confident. And that, that's a word I want to pull out of my, of, of my vocabulary tonight. 
he was so confident. He did not even blink an eye. He did not have faith. He did not have great faith. He had so great faith that he said, Lord, you don't even need to break stride in your journey. You just say the word and my servant will be healed. It was not, I think he'll be healed. It was not, I, 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 you know, somewhat believe he'll be healed. No, no. The centurion had so much faith and confidence. And if you'll get this, I can move on. He had so much faith and confidence that he didn't even want Jesus to be there. He said, wherever you're at, you say the word, my servant's healed. How did he get that kind of faith? How did this man get that kind of faith? Well, it's all wrapped around one word that we would never pull out of the text. Did he get the faith because of Jesus? Not necessarily. He had this faith because he understood one aspect of life. And I want us to look at it. In verse 9, Jesus said, oh my. Oh my, you're, you're telling me. And he turned around to everybody around him. If you look at verse number nine, he said, I'm going to tell you right now, I've not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. And the, and, the, and the Lord was coming back, and you'll find how did this earthly man ob obtain such faith? How did this mortal being had that much confidence in God? Can, can I stop and just say this? We want our children. To have that much confidence in God. You don't want them living in wishy-washy faith like you and I have sometimes. You want our children growing up saying this, my God can do great things. We want our children climbing to the top of that ladder and not doubting in their 20s. And not doubting in their 30s. And not doubting in their 40s. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? We want our children to stand up and say, God can. When you and I face difficult times, sometimes we, we are a little bit, mm, I don't know if God is, oh, no, no, no. We may have faith. And at times we may exhibit great faith, but we want our children to step up and have so great faith. So great faith that when something goes wrong, they say, God will take care of that. So great faith that when God calls them to do something, they don't look at what they have or don't have. They just simply say, God will provide the way. We want our children stepping out of, of, of grammar school and stepping into junior high and stepping into senior high and stepping into young adulthood and stepping into their 20s and 30s. And we want them just to have that kind of faith that if God said it, God's going to do it and God won't back up. My God won't fail me. My God will never let me down. Why would I go to the world? Because they can't do for me what my God does for me. This centurion had that kind of faith. How in the world did he get that kind of faith? I want you to look as you progress through the story. In verse number one, now when he had ended, in the audience of the people, he went into Capernaum, verse number two. The centurion servant was sick, verse number three. He heard of Jesus, never met Jesus. He heard of Jesus. Verse number four, the messenger said, oh, if there's somebody worthy for you to do anything, it's this guy because he loves our nation, built our synagogue. But then you come all the way down. Where did he get this? Because when you go all the way down to verse number eight, I want you to look at it, and I want you to underline one word, one word that made this man a believer, that that Jesus of Nazareth could heal my servant. One word from him. Here it is. For I also am a man set under what? Authority. You listen, I'm about to tell you. The relationship between our children and their authority is either putting more confidence in their God or it's destroying the relationship with God. I'm going to say it again. The reason this centurion could say, no, 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 that's the man that heals. You say, you speak a word, you don't have to be here because your word's good enough for me, it'll heal my servant. You want to know why? Because the centurion understood authority. The centurion understood, in fact, if you'll read it right there, for I what? 
also am a man set under what? Authority. Having under me what? Soldiers. There were 12 ranks in the Roman army. The centurion ranked right up there at the very top, probably about third from the, from the bottom. And he was several levels above the recruit. Guess what the centurion said? He said, I completely understand authority. I understand that when you say go, they're going to go. When you say come, they're going to come. And when you look at them and say you're going to do, they're going to do. Because that's how I respond to my authority. And that's how people respond to me. Now, see, we like that authority thing because we like telling people what to do. But the centurion must have had great authorities. Great authorities. Because the centurion became the authority that mimicked the authorities he had. And he was so the recipient of great authorities in his life. And he was a great authority that he had full confidence in authority. He has so much confidence in authority that here's what he said. Jesus is the authority on healing. And because he is the authority, all you got to do, God, Jesus, is just say one word. We're healed. Because your word's good enough for me. Oh, to God, would we, we, we get to the point in our Christian life to where his word is good enough for us. Would our children get to the point to where his word is good enough for me? It's right there in the book, good enough for me. But we want the authoritativeness without the proper relationship that authority should have. The authority that mimics the centurion will be the authority that will build so great faith in those he leads. Each of us have a responsibility. Do you know that I as pastor have a responsibility to leave behind me members who have so great faith? A dad has a responsibility to leave behind his trail children that have so great faith. Everybody is to be that kind of authority. So I will tell you this, that when I broke down the centurion and his authority style, it was amazing to me. No wonder everybody had full confidence that when the authority said, go do that, yes, sir. And there's no wonder there was such a bond between it. We're going to look at several things, that there was such a bond between this centurion, the authority, that he said, Jesus, I get it. I have authorities. I am an authority. You're an authority to heal people. I understand how this should go, so you don't even have to show up. Just speak a word. I kind of highlighted this. Every authority is either building or destroying their followers' faith in God with every interaction and with every passing day. I'm going to say that again. Every authority is either building or destroying their followers' faith in God with every interaction and with every passing day. Whenever I find a Christian's faith in God's word and ability being at a weakened state, then I can trace it back to a leader who did not use his authority to build faith in the follower. We must be building the follower's faith because one day, mom and dad, we pass off the scene. One day, church member, pastor passes off the scene. One day, there is nobody to tell you what to do, and the earthly authority will step out of the way, and you're going to be faced with one glaring fact. You and God got to do business. And your ability to pick up the phone and call a dad and pick up the phone and call a mom or call somebody to help them get them to fix a situation will no longer exist. And you're going to have to have the number to God's throne to pick up the phone and call him in prayer and know God will fix this. But it's that authority's relationship. You know, the centurion got it. The centurion understood, oh, you don't need to come my way. You just speak a word. Because you've got the authority, because in essence he was saying this, I have a relationship with my authority, and I have a relationship with my servants, so if you're the authority, then you must feel the same way 
that my authority feels about me and I feel about my followers. I'll give you several things that when God brought this out to me, I truly, in my quiet time, I got to be honest with you, I had to repent a little bit and then I had to put it into who I was. This is incredible. Look at, look at Luke chapter 7 verse 2. Here we go. Some insight into the centurion. Why did he have that much faith? And I want you to write down this statement. Authority must build relationships. Authorities must build relationships. Authorities cannot be CEOs. They must be relationship people. If you're the conductor of a train, don't go talk to the passengers while you're driving the train. You stay right there. Ignore all the passengers. If you're the pilot, don't come out and tell me it's on autopilot while you walk up and down the aisles and say, oh, we'll be okay for another 300 miles. No, 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 no. Go back in there. I don't care what it's on. I want somebody sitting there. But if you have people under you, then you have to build relationships. And if you want to build the faith in God to a so great faith, then you've got to build those people's faith in you because you ultimately represent the supreme authority, and that is God. Whether you like it or not, gentlemen, the day you asked her to marry you, you became an authority. The day y'all decided to have children, you became authorities. The day you decided to move up in business and now you're a manager with people under you. Now you're a VP with people under you. Now you own the business with people under you. Or you're a teacher with people under you. Or you're a Sunday school teacher, a bus captain, a deacon. It doesn't matter. If you are sitting at the top tier and you have anybody and you are that centurion, then it is the relationship that you build that makes all the difference in the world with the faith. You and I that have strong faith we have been great recipients of some great relationships that built our faith in God. Let me give you several things. Number one, the centurion had a relationship with his servants. The centurion had a relationship with his servants. You say, well, that's so elementary, pastor. I know it is, but it's something we stumble over. Because look at what what he was concerned about in verse number two. And a certain centurion servant, look at the next phrase, who was what? dear unto him can you say that who was what dear unto him you know what this leader this this leader of a hundred this centurion you know what he said you're dear to me i'm going to reach down you're my servant but you are dear to me and then look where the relationship extended to who was dear unto him was what sick and ready to what die here this authority cared for this servant Did you hear that? Because that's foreign anymore in leadership. Cared. I mean, cared. You know, you can tell a lot about the family structure on how the dad cares or cares not for the children. And a lot of times fathers seem, well, you know, you're weak because you, you express love to your daughter. No, no, no. You're strong because you express love to your daughter. You're weak because you tell your son that you love him and you hug him. Oh, no, you're not. You are strong if you reach out to your son. You say, well, I'm going to teach him how to be a man. Then teach him how to be manly. And manly is not how much you can bench press. Manly is when you care. The, The most manly thing you'll ever do is you care. Because if you are not a caring man, then you will not build a relationship. They get work ethic. They get this. But you ought to have a hug. You ought to have a caring. You ought to care for the condition of people. People people are done with authorities that don't care. They're done. Care. One of our one of our our men in the church had somebody working for him that was at the hospital and. And uh, Kelly and I went up to the hospital and we went to the wrong room, which I thought was the right room. So I'm there waxing eloquent about being sent here on behalf of someone who loves you. And as a church, we're praying for you. And the whole room was filled with people only to find out it was the wrong room. 
I mean, this guy was going, no, I don't know who he is. Yeah, you do. You know who this is. And we just want to express we love you. And we have been praying for you. And we are praying that you get, 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 get healed quickly. And, 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 and he was looking at me like, I don't even know who you are. I don't know who this guy is. And, and I went out and got my car. And Kelly said, do you think we went to the wrong room? And I said, no, we didn't go to the wrong room. Because he said, well, she's like, well, sweetheart, he really didn't respond when you called his name. And I was like, no. No. Well, the gentleman was walking out in the parking lot, and he said, hey, did you get to go see him? I said, yeah. Then it dawned on me, I went to the wrong room. <laughs> and when I went back up to the right room and walked in, the gentleman, who was an employee, said this. He cares. Speaking about the authority. That's what I'm about to tell you. If you want to build the faith in God, you represent God. You stand in the stead of God. Be that authority. Teacher, be that authority that cares. Care that the student's failing. Dad, care that something's wrong. Care. And we don't have that anymore. But the centurion had great faith. You want to know why? Because he had a relationship with his, his authority cared for him. And he was just caring for his servants. And it was a caring world that they were living in. He cared if he was sick or not. He cared that he was at the point of dying. And then look at this if you don't mind because I'm just going to plow right through it. Look at verse number 3. Look at this, the centurion. And when he had heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the what? Amazing. The elders of the Jews. The second thing, the centurion had a relationship with other leaders. I want you to think about this. He had such customer service that he could go to the other leaders and say, hey, could you do me a favor? And other leaders said, oh, absolutely. What do you want? I need some help. Absolutely. What do you want? I need you to go talk to Jesus about just saying the word. Let me tell you something. There's something wonderful that we're getting ready to look at because this centurion, part of the Roman government, look at this, went to the, what's it say, the elders of the what? Jews. This centurion that the Roman government really did not have a good name. Guess what he did? He was able to reach across to the Jews and say this. Can, can you religious people do me a favor? I have somebody that's sick here. Can you go ask Jesus? And look what the Jews did. And when they heard of the, Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews. What's the next word? Beseeching him. You know what the word beseech means? Pray, I beg. It just wasn't, oh, by the way, the, 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 the centurion over there, he, he needs some help. Uh-uh. It was the word beseech. It was the word pray. It was the word that said, hey, I have a friend. He's in leadership, and he could really use your help. And then look what it says there. And they said in verse number four, and when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was what? Worthy. Worthy. You know that you are mastering leadership when other leaders say, now that's a worthy man. Anybody can browbeat followers into doing and have them perform with no relationship. But I will ask you this. What's your relationship like with other authorities? Teacher, what's your relationship like with the other teachers? Parents, what is your relationship like with the other parents? Manager, you have a 12-hour shift you're in charge of. What is your relationship like with the other managers? Because you show me your relationship with your followers, do you care? And then show me your relationship with your other leaders. And is there a relationship? Would they help you? Would they carry your passion? Can they carry who you are? When we were raising Deanna, rearing Deanna, whatever grammatically right word, when we were beating Deanna, and uh, when, when she was being reared, and uh, can I tell you something? Our biggest concern with her when we went to leave her with someone outside the family was this, because our family was very busy, uh, you know, growing family, same time we were. And it was like, okay, who, who can we leave her with that, is, that, that would protect her like we would? 
We didn't look for somebody with the same standards necessarily. Guess what we look for? We look for somebody with the same respect for our authority. That if Deanna ever decided to do anything other than what her mom and dad wanted her to do, then those authorities would say, oh, that time out. No, your dad said no. Your mama said no. And our daughter was able to go from house to house when we were trying to care for our Gia some critical times. In every authority, she never missed a beat from one home to the next home to the next. You want to know why? Because whether it was my brother or my sisters or my parents or my in-laws, they all had the same thing. We respect that authority and we will respect that and we will do it the same way they would do it as if you were at their home. Boy, what a beautiful way to run a school. What a beautiful way to run a business. What a beautiful way to live life. What a beautiful way to do it. But when the rulers can't even get along, then something's wrong and something's not right. No wonder there was so great faith. Want to know why? Because the centurion had never known any other kind of authority. He just had that kind of authority to where his authorities cared. So he thought it was only natural for him to care. He saw his authorities get along with other people. So he thought, well, it's only natural for me to get along with other authorities. And no wonder that he had faith. Why wouldn't Jesus come heal his servant? Why wouldn't Jesus come? Do you see the innocence and the simplicity with no suspicion? Well, what were the rulers talking about over there? What were they doing over there? You're not really sick. Get into work. Can I tell you something? When there's caring for the servants and then there's a relationship with other rulers, you're going to be okay. I'm enjoying working uh, with the gentlemen that, that uh, are your assistant pastors here at the church. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I have enjoyed the past couple of months more than what even they realize. Because they're is this mutual camaraderie between the rulers. And do you know what the outcome's going to be? Our children are going to have great faith in God. Because they're going to see no conflict. I've got to hurry because we've kicked the air off, I think, too soon. Number three, look at it. The centurion, number three, look at verse number five, cared about the spiritual needs of the people. Look what this says about him in verse number five. This is why he was worthy. He said, for he loveth our what? Nation. For he hath built us a what? Synagogue. Do you know what that means? This centurion got it that I am to care about the spiritual needs of the people around me. One of our men, I asked him if I could use the story. We were talking and I I said... uh, I said, man, how's it going at work? And he goes, it's going, it's going good, Pastor. He said, I kind of hit a rough spot the other day. And I said, uh, what, what kind of rough spot did you hit? He said, well, I was just having a bad day. Listen to this story, because I think this is incredible. He said, I just hit a rough spot, and I'm walking down the hallway where I work, and, and it was just not a good day. Things were just kind of tumbling around me. My boss stepped out and said, hey, hey, I'm going to call him Joe. His name's not Joe. Joe, come here. Stepped into the office, my boss closed the door and said this, your spirit looks a little bit heavy. Is there anything I can do? He said, it so shocked me. It so shocked me that I just burst into tears. I'm a grown man, but I started crying. And I said, well, there is. He said, I told him two or three things. Listen to this. He said, well, let me encourage you that the Lord knows what he's doing. And the Lord would never put any more on you than you can bear. And when you get a chance, once you read this scripture, I think it will help you. We have so put God in the closet that we think you read a book, get over it. Grow up, get over it. Do you know what made the centurion say, I get authority because I just say go and they go and they come, they come, they do, they do because that's how I'm treated. And he understood, I must care about the spiritual needs. Listen to me very closely. You may see the physical, but that's a spiritual being running the physical. This whole world is wrapped around the spiritual. People aren't spiritually healthy. But it's our job as leaders 
not just to make sure they physically are not dying and that they physically are okay, but when's the last time spiritually, Dad, you prayed with your children? When is the last time spiritually that you did something for your wife? When is the last time you spiritually cared? I know you're teaching that Sunday school class, but when is the last time as the students were leaving your table or leaving your class, you just said, hey, come here, let's pray. I want to pray for you. It's until we meet the spiritual needs. I'm afraid that we get into dating or courting or whatever you want to call it. And you ask a couple that's getting close to getting serious. When's the last time you as a couple prayed together? And when a couple looks at you like, prayed? Like, why would I pray? Guys, listen to me. You're not going to make a good authority in that, you know, that lady's life unless you can meet her spiritual needs. They said about the centurion, he loved us and he built us a synagogue. You want to know why? Because the centurion said, you need some place to worship. You're spiritual. You need some place to worship. No wonder he said, that's how I'm treated. That's how I treat other people. Just tell Jesus, say a word. He never flinched. You want to know why? It's because that relationship with authority, then he understood Authority. Luke chapter 7, verse number 6. I just, the more I, I just started circling things, my study Bible looks like my grandkids got a hold of it. Look at verse number 6. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was, not, was now not far from the house, the centurion sent what? Oh my. That can't happen. I can't have any friends. The centurion sent what? Friends? You mean like the posse? You mean like, hey, homeboy. You mean friends? You mean people that were actually friends? Am I allowed to have friends? Am I allowed to have people I enjoy being around? Yes. Yes. How about we get off our white horse and stop riding through the crowd... And stop running through the crowd or from the crowd. How about we make some friends? It's a novel idea. You know what he said? Hey, friend, could you go do something for me? The centurion had friends. Yes, he was the authority. Yes, but can I tell you honestly? No wonder those people would go do anything for him. Want to know why? Because in his authority, he got it. As an authority, he mastered the art of faith. And that was this. As an authority, he had a relationship. He cared about them physically. As an authority, he got along great with all the other authorities. As an authority, he cared about the spiritual needs. As an authority, he had friends. And then look at number seven. I love this. Look at it. Luke 7, verse 7. Last point I'm going to give you, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Luke 7, 7. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say to one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh. But look at verse number 6. Here's what he said. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, Trouble not thyself, for I am not, what? Worthy. <laughs> the number one missing element in leadership, are you ready? Humility. Good old-fashioned humility. We don't have it anymore. I don't know about you, but have you ever been in a, a, a franchise chain? We have several of them here in town we have people who own the McDonald's here in town, and we have people who own other businesses here in town. I was in one of those franchise-type things. And, uh, and I was sitting there, and I was eating and, and uh, talking with one of our members. It happened to be where we were meeting at. And we were sitting there, and this gentleman and his wife come walking in. The gentleman came walking in, and I'm speaking fact. The gentleman come walking in, and he was howling with everybody. Well, then it dawned on me, it dawned on me, that this was the owner of the franchise. Behind him was his wife, obviously, and she was too good for anybody. He was down to earth, but she 
was like. This little girl came up and said something to her. She was an employee there and wanted to do something for her. And she was like, no. And kind of stood in the corner. I thought to myself, where is the humility? Listen to me. Those people are making them a ton of money. The world does not want authorities with no humility. Take off the crown. Throw down the scepter. Get rid of the robe. Get rid of the shiny throne. And just get down there and be that person that I love people. These are my friends. These are the people that I care about. These are the people I want to spend the rest of my life with. This is what it's all about. And you watch if somebody's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't build because their authority shared a relationship so that when their authority says, by the way, God cares about you. Did you have any idea that when you say to somebody, God cares about you, that they're instantly going to transfer, does God really care? Yes, because you care. Does God really care? God cares about you. Does he really care? And why your belief, if God cares, will only come if you're convinced the authorities in your life care. Because people are always transferring from earthly authority to supreme authority. And that's why the centurion didn't know any other way to do it. He was just simply, no, 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 you don't even have to come. I'm not even worthy. You just say the word, they'll be healed. You just say the word, they'll be healed. Where did he get this great faith? Because the authority was right. I'm going to ask you three things and then I'm done. What kind of an authority are you? Do you care? Do you care? Do you care about the spiritual needs? Do you get along with other rulers? Are you truly that authority that you're like, no, 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 no. I care. The second thing I would ask you is this. If you're not that kind of authority, are you willing to change for the sake of building faith in other people? Are you willing to change? Well, I'm too busy. Don't be too busy. Well, I just got a lot on my mind. Empty your mind. Well, I'm just, you know, you, you know how it is. No, we shouldn't know how it is. We should be able to act in such a way that, that I'm going to use an illustration and, and, and then I'm done. And I mean that. We should act in such a way that when our children, come here, come here. Bob, yeah, stand right there, if you don't mind. That here's, here's Brother Gaza. How old are you? 14. Stand right there. There you go. Face me. Face me. Here's, here's Bob, 14 years of age. I, as an authority, should so interact with him that he's like, well, pastor cares, and pastor would never, and pastor cares about me spiritually, that when I pass off the scene, that it's easy for him to transfer the trust in this authority to the trust in that authority. Let me tell you something. No man lives to himself and no man dies to himself. Thank you. Are we building that kind of faith in our kids? Do they have that kind of confidence? It starts with us showing them this is how you do it. They can't see God, but boy, God cares. They can't see God, but God wants to do some big things. May they step from your family into life believing that their God would never do them wrong. Heavenly Father.